did you want to go over to Plutus now and say, how does that compare to um, Plutus? Like uh, you saw some documentation on Plutus mm -hmm. uh, and you saw the Plutus playground. Are those the kind of tools that should be out there for developers? And, and are there enough tools out there to get started on Plutus uh, right away? Yeah. So I think from the time that Plutus was first announced and the first iteration of Plutus really came into, into the light, it, it's already seen a lot more support in terms of documentation than I think people realize. So that, that Plutus playground is a great first step. I think if you have a, a custom language and you don't have um, line by line examples for people to look at, you don't have a, an environment where people can drop code in and test it in their browser, you're already losing out on a lot of potential users of your, your solution. Uh, so the playground is great because even though it's, you know, there are only a few examples, you can see exactly what they're, what they're supposed to do and you can run them there. And the documentation for Plutus is pretty robust. Obviously, I think you can always improve documentation and always give more examples, always give uh, more information, but it's consistently updated whenever there are new versions. I mean, I think if you go in there, I think there are, you know, at least four or five already builds for, for Plutus that have different documentation updates and, and such. Um, but the main difference between Plutus and Solidity is that Plutus is based on a functional language, which is Haskell. And that differs completely from Solidity, which is an imperative language. And I think the main difference between those two, if you want to think about it in simple terms, is that imperative languages like Solidity, they give you a lot of room to be creative because you're telling the computer exactly what steps that it has to take and how to take those steps to solve a problem. With functional languages like Plutus that's derived from Haskell, you're telling the computer what you want it to do, and it already knows how it's going to go about doing that, right? So you have a lot more, uh, a lot more predictable output for that code when you, you know, that you go to deploy it. And the reason for that is what we talked about before. It's people having less experience developing something with solidity and putting something out there that behaves in an unpredictable way because it, it was vulnerable in some way. You mentioned that in your video that the for imperative languages, the state is constantly changing. So, mm -hmm. you know, as more developers come onto this ecosystem, it becomes harder and harder to delineate exactly what values equal what values because everyone's kind of creating their own rules. Um, and, and I wanted to compare that to a functional programming language. Is there a way for Plutus as a functional programming language or Haskell as a functional programming language to utilize some of the benefits of an, of an imperative programming language, um, mm -hmm. being more creative, but at the same time maintaining a certain level of rigidity? Right, and I think there's been talk of that in the, the Plutus ecosystem of how to make Plutus a little bit more stateful, meaning allow it to have some element of state and in, the rea in reality, I think it already does because Plutus has the ability to create transactions which have a certain state on the Cardano blockchain itself. So in that test net, if you were to deploy a, a Plutus contract, in a sense, you're modifying state of the blockchain, just not necessarily state within that contract. So I think it's it's always an interesting an interesting concept when you think about how can we create the perfect programming language because they're there really isn't one, but I think Plutus has take decided, or the, the Plutus team, I should say, has decided to take the language in a different direction because they realize that now is starting to get, we're starting to get to the point where specialization makes sense. So you can create specialized languages that make a, an acute design decision to go one direction over another. You know, where Solidity and Ethereum has always been you can build anything that you want with this and you have you have zero limitation except from the technical side of scalability etc you know i think plutus is more targeted at you know we're going to create possible potential for you know maybe some fringe supply chain use cases for financial use cases especially um, a lot of numbers game um, utilizations as well um, i can even see engineering departments using this for um, you know, for traceable calculations that are important for for operations, maybe in in, uh, in the space industry. I think that's where Plutus will will thrive.
You know, that's oh. interesting that you can like project and say, hey, this is what this language could possibly be used for. That's the kind of visionaries we need in this space. So if you were to compare the two, and you already did kind of compare the two, and you got solidity, uh, is the strongest point on solidity like flexibility? And then what is the really strong point on Plutus? Kind of like in simple terms, let's assume I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. What's mm -hmm. the strong point on solidity? And then what's the strong point for Plutus? Strong point for solidity, I think you hit it on the head. I think it's flexibility and the relative ease with which you can learn it and start becoming functional with that language. Um, and not to confuse terms, the functional language, Plutus, I think the strength there is that it's it's got a really high assurance level that what you develop is going to behave exactly the same way in your test environment as it is when you put it out there to the public. So when you build something, it's predictable. For me, I'm a developer. I think you ask any developers, we like deterministic stuff. And deterministic basically means that whatever you put into a certain system, it should spit you out the same thing as long as that input's the same. What you don't want is you don't want to be feeding in the number two and getting out different stuff at the end every single time. That's non-deterministic. We don't like that. Does that mean something's broken there? Gotcha. That's a great explanation. I had a question because at, towards the end of your Plutus video, you were saying that Ethereum and Cardano are basically, they, they forked, I mean, not forked, but they're going separate directions. Yes, yeah, I agree. And um, But at the same time, Ethereum 2.0 and Viper, and it seems like Ethereum is moving towards maybe reducing that level of chaotic state within mm -hmm. Solidity and moving towards more functional and, um, you know, maybe uh, the opposite, vice versa for Cardano. So is it possible that towards the end, they're going to to be chasing the same use cases? Or do you think that they're just going to completely diverge? Theoretically, yes, that's possible. Um, you know, and I can't speak for the path that they're taking with, you know, with Ethereum. But I believe just based on, you know, my best guess that what's going to happen is in this next iteration of the virtual machine for Ethereum, they're going to just open it up a little more with um, ability to use more different languages. Um, Viper will probably be included in that, but I don't think Solidity is going anywhere. I don't think that they've given up on using Solidity, even though it has its problems. I think Solidity is fixable, honestly. I think the infrastructure just needs to change a little bit from the virtual machine perspective you can tighten up the rules a little bit and make it harder to make a mistake, um, you know, with governance practices. So I don't think that, uh, I don't think that it's going to be a situation where they abandon solidity altogether and move towards functional.